guys are always amazing. Good morning, everybody. So wonderful to be here with you all. Um, today we have a little, a little change in our day, but it's not too much. Uh, there won't be any announcements, but you do have your Inside, inside Seaside, so you can check, um, check out what's happening here at Seaside. This morning, we have Carolyn Holder, who is holding the light, holding the consciousness of this morning's message, so give her a round of applause. Thank you. All right, so we have some exciting things for you, but first, um, we're going to stand up and greet our neighbors. Good morning, everybody. Let's all stay standing together. We're going to sing our congregational song, I Am a Light, which is a call and response song. So I'm going to sing a line, and you just sing it, shout it right back to me. sing better than first service, I think. Pretty good. Thank you, Danielle. 
Okay, so this is the time and space um, in our service uh, that we have a practitioner that is going to do an invocation for us, and she is a longtime practitioner here at Seaside. Uh, give a round of applause for Kathleen Lees. Ah, what a joy, what a joy it is to be in this space, this beautiful space that we've created for ourselves. And I know that each of us are those shining lights, that shining light of spirit coming right through us. And we come here together to Seaside to share that light, knowing that it will be loved and appreciated and understood. We also come here for wisdom and guidance and support. And I know today that the message from Dr. David will touch your heart and give you meat to take out and to use in your everyday life, meaningful information and lovingly delivered and lovingly received. So knowing that that is so, I embrace the unity of this community and know that we each will let our light shine invigorated by what we experience today. So it is. Thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, everybody. For those of you that are just arriving and for those of you who are brand new here at Seaside, I want you to know that uh, we have been expecting you and we love you already. We loved you before you even know who we were. And we prepared for your coming here. So at every entrance, the two main entrances, we have a guest packet for you, which has all the information about Seaside, CSL, you have a Science of Mind magazine in there. I encourage you to pick up your packet, and I also encourage you to sign up for the daily emails from Dr. Christian. They're inspirational emails. You have contemplation and meditation. There's just so much resources here at Seaside. Um, in that packet, you also get the basic beliefs, and um, some may disagree that the most important piece of uh, information you have in there is that I believe you have a 15% off coupon for the muffins that we provide here. Please make sure that you redeem your uh, coupon. Uh, please go get your uh, packets. They have been created especially with love for you. So my name is Catherine Cespedes, and I am a practitioner, uh, in, practitioner in training here at Seaside. I just uh, finished year one. I'm going on to year two. And this morning, we have a guest speaker, uh, Doc, Reverend Dr. David S. Goldberg. And for some of you, you may know that he is the editor of the Science of Mind magazine. For some of you who don't know, he is the editor of the Science of Mind <laughs> magazine. And... <laughs> He is our uh, guest speaker this morning, so thank you for being here. His message this morning is, uh, love is always healing, and so that is what I will be reading about this morning. So my reading comes from the holisticmindbodyhealing.com, and the title of it is The Healing Power of Healthy Self-Love, written by Val Silver. Self-love heals when you make sure you eat right that you get enough rest, that you exercise and get some soul time. It heals when you recharge your batteries by spending time with your favorite people and doing what you enjoy, even by yourself, without guilt. You may feel guilty about valuing and caring for yourself. Just let that go. 
Putting the healing power of all, of love in all its forms to work in your life is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself and others. If being of service to others as a mother or a rescuer or a doctor or a carpenter is important to you, then you owe it to them to take care of yourself. You can only give what you have. If you get stressed out or sick or worse, you cannot, you cannot be of real service to anyone. These are strong words. They're hard words, but they're true. I say them with love for you. Love heals not only your body, but your mind and relationships as well. Bless you. It is the force that heals others and our world because we are all one. Thank you, Catherine. It's a great day to be here because we have some incredible guests with us today. As you can see, I am going to introduce our fantastic musical guest artist. She's someone that I'm sure all of you recognize. She has been a beloved member of this community for many, many years, a truly incredibly talented singer, songwriter. Please give a big, warm seaside welcome for Peggy Lebo. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. You guys are the best. I feel like when I come here, I feel like I'm home. So um, this uh, next first song is inspired by a poem by Hafiz. And the poem is, when you are lonely and in darkness, I wish I could show you how brilliant your light is. It's called Shine. Your sun is sinking low and you feel the wind begin to blow. I will stand beside you. When your dreams seem so far and you don't remember who you are, I will remind you. Cause every sweet possibility lives inside.
lives inside of you and me, waiting there for us to turn the key. We are shining, we are golden, we are light. It's in our hearts, it's in our souls, it's in our mind. We are shining, we are a beacon in the night. Let's show That's Peggy, everybody. Wonderful. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning. He is Reverend Dr. David S. Goldberg. <laughs> so when I was given today's topic, Love Always Heals, I almost immediately went to Valentine's Day. I tend to be a hopeful romantic. So I went there, and when I went there, it took me back to the ninth grade. And when I grew up, when I was going to school, that was the last year of junior high before we moved into high school. So we were the, the big people on campus, and we were running things, or so we thought. <clears throat> excuse me, just getting in the tail end of a cold here. And um, I happened to be the, the co-president of the student council. And each one of the student groups had the opportunity to run one of the big activities during the year. And the student council's challenge was to put on the Valentine's Day dance. So we had this great idea to get more of our colleagues there, to get more of our fellow students there and all of our friends. And we, we uh, created a guerrilla marketing campaign way before we knew the term guerrilla marketing campaign. So all of my pals and I got to school really early on Monday of Valentine's week, and we plastered all over the school. We had flyers, and we had posters, and we had banners, and they were in classrooms, and they were on lockers, and they were in bathrooms, and yes, they were in the teacher's lounge. And so school is getting ready, and we're all feeling pretty good about ourselves. And before the announcements even started, we hear... Will David Goldberg please report to the principal's office? Well, I was president of the student council, so I wasn't concerned. So I went trotting in there and uh, said hello to Mr. Tonish, and he called me Mr. Goldberg. I said, hi, Mr. T. He said, Mr. Goldberg. And there were three or four teachers there as well. This isn't looking or feeling good. He said, he's looking at this flyer, and he looks up at me. Mr. Goldberg? Are you responsible for these? I said, yes, sir. We're, we're trying to promote the dance. He said, while I appreciate the enthusiasm, while I appreciate what might be considered the expertise in marketing, I need you and your fellow students to go around the school and take down every one of these within the next hour. So that was kind of a mixed message, right? You're awesome, you're doing all the right stuff, and no. <clears throat> so I said, yes, sir, and he, he saw that I was a little confused, and so he was offering another point of clarification when he said, and he held it up and he showed it to me, and he said, Mr. Goldberg, asking your fellow 7th, 8th, and ninth graders if they have VD fever is not appropriate. <clears throat> <laughs> we said, do you have VD fever? Do you have Valentine's Day fever? Now, I got to tell you, we, we didn't have the technology and everything that the young people of today have, but I'm pretty sure everybody knew what VD meant. Um, and we were just trying to get people to the dance. 
So the good news is we had a great turnout at the dance, right? Um, being in public relations and communication for any number of years, say whatever you want about me as long as you spell my name right. <clears throat> so fast forward then to today when we're talking about love is always healing. In the textbook, in our seminal text, The Science of Mind, Dr. Holmes mentions love 92 times, and that is quantified uh, in the back of the book where we can cross-reference everything and where to find it in the book. And that does not include mentions of loved, lovely, lovers, loves, loving kindness, or beloved. So clearly, love was on Ernest's mind. And then as I reflect on our theme as well, we know that a basic tenet of religious science is there's nothing to be healed, only truth to be revealed. So I'm kind of going back and forth and what is the theme and, and how are we pre um, presenting principle and what does that look like? So with that, Dr. Holmes writes, the practitioner knows that the spiritual man needs no healing but that he has yet, excuse me, but that this has not yet become revealed to his mind. What the healer does is to mentally uncover and reveal the truth of being, which is that God is in and through every human, and that this indwelling presence is already perfect. So nothing to be healed, only truth to be revealed. So to continue to muck up the waters and get me confused in, in, in my mind, <clears throat> on the other hand, the phrase, love is always healing, the topic uh, of the talk today, is mentioned specifically on page 233 of the textbook. A thought of love is always healing, and particularly so in the case of constipation. So best I could tell, we have 92 mentions of love and only one mention of constipation. <clears throat> and thank you, Ernest, for you know, engaging in all of life's circumstances with us. So my point in sharing a bit of my confusion with you is I am so grateful to Dr. Christian for the invitation to stand at this storied platform in front of this beloved podium and speak with you today and with that topic of love is always healing, I could pretty much do anything I want. But any of you who have been around any kind of church for any length of time know that ministers do that anyway. So uh, away we go. And what a beautiful reading. Thank you, Catherine. You've learned, learned well in your years and in your first year of practitioner training. We didn't, we didn't speak directly about what I was going to address, and I love that your reading spoke to self-love. Because we know that there are many different kinds of love. We know there is the love that we feel for our spouse and our partner, for those of us who are in a primary relationship. We know there's the love that we feel for our children, for our parents, for our family, for our extended family, for our family of choice. We know that the love that we feel for our animals, for our four-leggeds, for the winged ones, for the crawlies, we love them all, and we know that the love that we have for everyone on the planet, those are all different kinds of love, and they're all equally as important and equally powerful. And as was so beautifully pointed out, we know as metaphysicians that that all starts with self-love. We know that I can't give what I don't have. We know that we can't give from an empty cup. So my invitation today is to share with you seven practices, if you will, to invite you deeper into that space of self-love, deeper into that place of healing, and deeper into that place of opening your heart to be able to do what you are here to do as you co-create your physical walk with the divine. So if it works for you, you can tie these seven practices, perhaps one for each day of the week. You can tie them to the chakras, perhaps one for each one of your chakras. However it works for you, however it flows. One of the many things I love about this teaching is there's no wrong way to do it. 
So, so jump in with me. So the first practice, and this is based loosely on the work of Deepak Chopra. Have any of you heard of him? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> it was a joy to be able to sit with him uh, for a couple of hours and for the story we did a couple of years ago in the magazine. Uh, what an extraordinary being. I digress. Uh, but this is based on uh, Dr. Chopra's work. The first uh, practice that I would suggest for you is that of forgiveness. We know that when we're holding on to something, when something is rubbing us the wrong way at best, right, and just has a hold of us and is turning us inside out at its worst, that it's not doing anything to that person that we're wound up about. And we're giving over the mental space, we're giving the emotional power to that, all of that is on us. So what does that forgiveness practice look like? I would suggest three different aspects of that. I forgive you, please forgive me, I forgive myself. Please join me. I forgive you, please forgive me, I forgive myself. Now isn't that huge? So we release that energy, we dissipate it in ourselves, we dissipate it with the individual or the circumstance where we're having the alleged conflict, we send it back into the nothingness from which it came, and we have created more emptiness in our vessel to receive more good and to create more of what we want. And that's just step one. So step two is gratitude. And I know that you all have heard, as have I, that if I say no more than thank you, that that's enough. That is enough to put us in that space, to put us in that energy, to put us in that flow of thankfulness and of gratitude. So for me, what that looks like is first thing in the morning and last thing at night. First thing in the morning in that beautiful space of kind of waking up and not ready to put my feet on the floor yet, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this day. I'm grateful to be a conscious being. I love my bed. Not that the hotel is horrible. And whatever is on your mind, whatever is in your heart, it simply allows you to get in that energy and you all understand energy. So too, last thing at night. Thank you for this day, spirit. Thank you for the good. Thank you for the interesting because it all has made me who I am and is preparing me as I continue to step in my greater yet to be tomorrow. So it is that attitude of gratitude. It is that space of thanksgiving. There's a reason why thanksgiving is one of the steps in our five-step uh, spiritual mind treatment or prayer treatment because it's, a, it's extraordinary powerful. So we talked about forgiveness. We talked about gratitude. The third piece I would invite you into, and I know many of you are already there, is meditation. It's been said that when we treat or when we pray, we're asking, not necessarily beseeching, but we're asking for ourselves or we're asking on behalf of someone. We're praying for health, we're praying for prosperity, we're paying, playing, uh, praying for perfect position. Uh, so oftentimes when we pray, we're asking. And when we meditate, we're, we're quiet and we're in that space of listening. So if you've ever had that experience, I, I, I sense I'm not the only one in the room when I'm a little wound up and, well, why isn't God listening to my prayers? Well, I've been good. Well, I've been praying. Well, why isn't this happening? Well, and away I go. And then when I'm able to get into that meditative space, when I'm able to center and ground myself, I'm able to remember that perhaps it's not spirit, perhaps it's not God, perhaps it's not the universe that isn't responding. Perhaps it's not me not being quiet enough to listen to the answer. And to be clear, sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is not yet. And that is why in my treatment, in my prayer work, I always include this or something better with grace and with ease. 
And I had a conversation with one of my ministerial mentors. Dr. Christian served as my mentor in school, and I'm so grateful for that experience. And this conversation didn't happen with him, it happened with another mentor. Uh, he, th this particular person had an issue with adding grace and ease to spiritual mind treatment or to prayer. He said, do you think you're, you're powerful enough that you can direct spirit? And I had to be with that for a moment. And my response was, I, I don't think I'm saying it to direct spirit. I'm saying it to prepare my human mind, to put my human ego at ease, to say, I know God is gonna bring that in, in the highest and best for me and all concerned, and I'm telling myself, however that arrives, whatever it looks like to my human eyes, that it's gonna be graceful and it's gonna be easy. So that's meditation. When you enter into that space, quiet enough to tap into the energy of the universe. You know that, right? You have access to the power of the universe. As a beloved late politician once said, not in relation to this, it's up to me to get my beloved nothingness out of the way and allow spirit to do whatever spirit is going to do with me. So we've talked about forgiveness. We've talked about gratitude. We've, as we continue to work through the process, the fourth piece is what is your purpose? What is your life purpose? And many of us in spiritual community have those conversations perhaps more frequently than some, whether we're looking at it for ourselves or whether we're um, looking at it on behalf of a client or somebody that, that we're working with or supporting in prayer work. And I would suggest to you, my friends, that your dharma, that your life purpose is exactly what you're doing right now. Be with that a moment. We know that as spiritual beings having a human experience, that we're here on purpose, that we're here for a unique expression. And while my human self may not know that, the divine knows that every moment of every day. So you wouldn't be doing anything that you're not called to do. That doesn't mean that in your co-creating your experience with the divine, that you can't be more of this tomorrow, that you can't release and be less of that, but you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So maybe, maybe it's more nuanced than we're taking credit for. Maybe it's not changing 180 degrees from a right brain occupation to a left brain occupation. Maybe it's a three degree shift because that still changes our trajectory dramatically. So be gentle with yourself as you explore that process of what is your life purpose and what is yours to do. And to that point of being with ourselves, the fifth item that I would suggest to you is be gentle with your self-talk. If you're saying, and don't look at me like that, you will talk to yourselves. <clears throat> if you're saying something to yourself that you wouldn't say to your beloved, that you wouldn't say to your grandchild, that you wouldn't say to your pet, that you wouldn't say to a complete stranger, then stop saying it to yourself because we spend the most time with ourselves. And the way that appears for me is when my ego is out there and my ego doesn't like something that I did or I know I could do it better or I know I could do it differently or wah, 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 wah. It's like, oh, geez, David. And sometimes it's a little more colorful. And I would never do that to my nieces, to my nephews, to my great nieces, to newborn Charlie. I wouldn't say that to them. Why do I get to say that to myself? Because what I know as a spiritual being having a human experience, that that one power, that one presence, that one ubiquitous, all-encompassing power that created me continues to dwell in me and express as me. So when I'm putting myself down, I'm putting God down. And that's not who I am. That's not how I choose to show up. So what we know is change your thinking, change your life. And as a part of that, we also know change your language, change your self-talk, change your life. 
So the sixth piece of that, in addition to talking to ourselves more powerfully and more positively, is how are we spending our time? You know, recent studies are showing that somewhere between 65 and 70% of us have a challenge when we get together with family, whether it's a holiday event or a wedding or a funeral or whenever we get together with blood family. So if you have that interesting Uncle David, you're not the only one. But the point is, we are always at choice. So when you're not in those familial situations, how are you choosing to spend your time? Who are you choosing to spend your time with? I shared earlier that when I was in Pratt class, we had a big group of people, and this one woman always sat down right next to me. And it was fine, and she was kind, and we prayed, and we did projects, and we did dyads, and we did everything we were supposed to do. And she later said, David, I wouldn't have made it through practitioner training without you. I said, well, Joanne, that's really kind, but I don't understand. We all did this together. She said, no, some days, you know, maybe more than I'd like to admit, when I got to class, I just really wasn't feeling very spiritual, and frankly, I didn't want to, you know, necessarily be there. I'd rather be doing something else. So I sat by you, and I plugged into your energy. And I'm like, oh, no wonder I was tired for two years. <laughs> So I share that with you by way of who are you consciously choosing to spend your time with? Are you consciously spending time with people who are vibrating at the same level you are, thus creating the harmonic convergence, right? Like attracts like, or is it more of a moth to the flame scenario where you're vibrating up here and some other interesting beings see that and feel that and they want some of what you have but they're not exactly sure how to get it, and it doesn't feel really good for anybody. So how are you spending your time? How are you choosing to give your time away? And just to build on that then, the final piece of that is volunteering. You are all here because you're on a spiritual path. You, all, you are all here because you are givers. You give to your family, you give to your loved ones, you give to strangers, you give up to and including everybody on the planet in one degree or another. For that, I am grateful. You are my people, you are my tribe, we are all in this together. And the whole point of volunteering is forming a mutually beneficial relationship. So you don't get extra karma points if it hurts, or if you're in pain, or if you don't like it. Do something that you love. Do something that makes your soul soar. Do something that makes your energy dance. If you like being with people in community, Seaside is glorious and wouldn't be able to do nearly the work that they do without volunteers. Volunteer in this amazing place. If that's not your gig, sit with the person in silence. Go to the shelter and hold an animal for an hour a week. Find something that feeds your soul and that raises the vibration for everyone and everything on the planet. So those are the, the seven practices that I would share with you that I would invite you into. Look at them all, look at one of them, look at a handful of them, whatever speaks to you, because you are here, and I invite you to take exactly what you need uh, from those seven pieces. And as we look at that, as we look at how we show up, once again, as spiritual beings having this human experiences, we have three choices. And I invite you to consider to move, through, to move through all of those areas, all of those opportunities with TLC. And the TLC in this case is we have the opportunity to take it, we have the opportunity to leave it, or we have the opportunity to change it. Those are basically the, the three categories of our choice. So if you decide to take it, you get to consciously be in that space of, I am clear what is happening here, I don't like all of it, and I know that the pros outweigh the cons, and that it's supporting me to getting me where I want to be, tomorrow, next week, next year, whatever that looks like. 
I am safe in this expression, and I am consciously deciding to take it. And as I reflect on that, I think about Mother Teresa from her, now Saint Teresa, uh, from her life story. When she was talking about, she was 19, she got the call uh, to be of service originally when she was 12. She's 19, a brand new nun, in her words, sitting in the squalor of the streets of Calcutta, India, in the soaking rain, crying. She had just been invited by the mother superior to go back to the convent to move into the managerial ranks in the convent. Now, to be sure, it wasn't a Four Seasons, but she had a roof over her head, she had a bed, and she had running water, none of which she had when she was working in the streets. She's 19, she's having a crisis of faith, she's sitting in the rain, she's crying, 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 and she said, what is mine to do? She completely surrendered. What is mine to do? And the message that she got was the same message that she always got, and that was, yours is to be of service. And so she knew. So she made the choice to take it. She could handle the conditions. She could handle the squalor. She was clear on what was hers to do. When she died... At the end of her life, there were 4,500 convents under the order that she created. I would suggest to you that that 19-year-old woman didn't have a concept of creating an entire branch within the Catholic Church of service. She was doing what was hers to do, and she decided to stay. She decided to take it. The other option is to leave it. You look at it, you feel into it, you think about it on every level, you know that this isn't serving you, whatever it is. So you get to decide to leave. So I had the great honor of working with an octogenarian who I had known through several incarnations professionally. And uh, I showed up as her family called and she, she had decided that she was going to leave the planet that her biodegradable flesh suit was no longer serving her and that she was complete and she thought that uh, her last civil right was deciding when when she was done with this physical walk. So anyway, long story short, I walk in, I'm visiting with her, And uh, I said, so how are you and what are you doing? We have five minutes of small talk. And she said, so I hear you're a minister now. And I said, well, yeah, Uh, that, that has been a pretty significant life switch for me. And I said, and that's why I'm here. How can I support you? My best ministerial self. And she said, you can't, I'm gonna off myself. (laughs) Okay. Um, And I said, so what does that look like? And we started to have a conversation. And I said, how do you want to be remembered? And then the tears came. And she said, I I want to be remembered as a teacher. And I want to be remembered as somebody who cared. And so she got the cocktail. She had full makeup. She was dressed in exactly what she wanted to wear with the loving support of her family. She um, took her cocktail at the uh, pre-described time and she made made her transition beautifully and peacefully exactly the way that she wanted to. And when I did her memorial a week later, she was remembered for her kindness and for being a teacher. And so she chose to leave. So we can take it, we can leave it, or we can change it. And as I shared in in the earlier service, I had a different example that I was gonna share with you around the change it piece. But in watching the news this morning, something just struck me so dramatically and so deeply. There in, some of you may have seen this. There's an entrepreneur who has developed lockdown lavatories. And these are portable toilets for classrooms. So when teachers and students find themselves in a lockdown situation, they have a way to relieve themselves. It would be really funny if it wasn't so sad that we have to prepare for that condition. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so the idea is, while other people, hopefully many of us, 
are working on a solution to that extraordinary circumstance. This person is trying to change it from within. We know it's gonna happen again. Let's do what we can to traumatize everybody involved as, as, um, as little as possible by taking care of some basic bodily needs. That is changing it. So as you engage then in this coming week and beyond, as you move into your life with more TLC, just know that you always have choice. You can take it, you can leave it, or you can change it. And in that regard, I have one more thing to share with you from Ernest Holmes. He says that hope is a subtle illusion and principle is not bound by precedent. So regardless of what we may have done before, principle always outweighs precedent. At one point, slavery was legal. At one point, women were not allowed to vote. Just because we did it doesn't mean we have to keep doing it. So to that point, Ernest writes, because we fail to realize that principle is not bound by precedent, we limit our faith to that which has already been accomplished, and few miracles result. When, through intuition, faith finds its proper place under divine law, there are no limitations, and what are called miraculous results follow. So I wanted to share with you that uh, Rick and I had been together for about three years, and we knew that we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And we went to Massachusetts to visit his mom and his dad for what would be our last visit. They were both 89 and living in the nursing home together. And they were still an awesome team. Mom, mom's mind was so sharp and, and so in place. And uh, her physical body wasn't where she wanted it to be. And dad was a strong ox and a retired Navy guy, and he was on top of everything, and his cognitive skills weren't what he wanted them to be. So together, as often happens in long-term relationship, they compensated and they were beautiful together. So, you know, I showed up and uh, doing what I knew how to do, I, was going, I brought them gifts, and they, living in Boston, they're huge Boston Patriots fans. And I have to tell you, it took about everything in my being for this Denver Broncos guy to, to buy Boston Patriots jerseys. <laughs> but I did. And so mom and dad got their jerseys and they're wearing them. And then as a part of the natural flow of the conversation, um, I asked for their permission to marry their son. And dad says, he stands up, he comes over and he shakes my hand and he said, you make my son happy, you make me happy. And mom, bless her heart, couldn't quite get up, and she just leaned forward and kissed me on the cheek, a tear running down hers, and she just shook her head yes. So I had his parents' blessing and permission for us to get married. And as the conversation continued, just a few minutes later, with her tongue planted firmly in her cheek, Rick's 89-year-old mother says, Honey, I'm so happy for you, you're marrying a Jewish doctor. So our response was the same as yours, you know, when, when, when we quit chuckling. Uh, and he said, well, thanks, Mom, but he's not that kind of Jew, and he's not that kind of doctor. <laughs> and indeed, I do believe I'm the only Goldberg who's a member of the Bacon of the Month Club. Uh, <laughs> what I do know is love is that one power, that one presence. It is that one energy, however identified, whatever we call it. It is all of who I am. It is all of who you are. It is all we have to give. So when we take that opportunity to work on loving ourselves, then we can go forth and offer that powerful, powerful tool to everyone on the planet. Thank you for your time.
that's even better the second time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy, and welcome home. It's always, it's always a pleasure to have you here. 
This time, I'd like to um, welcome everyone into our offering. This is the time and space where I am going to invite our ushers up to the front of the stage. And for those of you that are watching online, I just want to say thank you. We feel your presence. And for those of you who auto-tithe, and so for those days that you can't come to Seaside, we still feel your love. We feel your support um, on, on those Sundays that you are not here. So I know that God is right here in this very space. I know that God is abundance. I know that God is prosperity. I know that I am one with this God, one with this source, one with this divine intelligence, this divine entity. And so I am so grateful for this abundance, for this flow that assists us in creating these Sundays, in creating this radiance and this light and being a beacon for our community. And so I am so grateful for this time and this space that we get to pause and we get to be a part of the law of circulation for it is not why we do it it is how we do it and so i release these words as divine law knowing that all is good and all is well and so it is thank you and so that this this offering has been blessed it is blessed I know that it is handled in good stewardship I know that it is it participates in all the wonderful events speakers everything that we do here at Seaside is done with such love with such dedication with such passion and so I know that it goes out there and it multiplies and it touches every individual that it comes across and so I release these words knowing that all is good and so it is this is our board of trustees, uh, Josh Franklin. So give him a round of applause. So I'm waiting for the kitties to come in, but while they come in, I have a few announcements for you. Um, we have two classes coming up just to keep in mind. One of them is how to be a masterful manifester, and that is taught by Dr. Christian. It starts on July 10th, it's three weeks. Um, you all have a beautiful flyer in your programs, and we also have Meditation is More Than You Think, and that's being taught by our education director, Deb Sadler. I don't think we have any children coming in right now. They're probably still putting on their shoes and all that good stuff. So we will continue on. I want to say thank you to every individual that makes Sunday possible. So I'm going to start off in the sound booth with Matt. Thank you so much for giving us sound today. We also have Marv. Uh, Marv creates the Inside Seaside, and he does our visuals. So thank you so much, Marv. We have Timothy, who is running away. He just ran out the door, so you won't, get up, you won't be able to see him. But he does our live streaming. So thank you to all the individuals that are behind the cameras to make that happen. 
We also have Carolyn Holder, who is holding the light, um, holding the space for this morning's message. So, so, uh, so thank you so much, Carolyn. And of course, we have the wonderful Seaside Band. So thank you for being here every single Sunday. Our guest artist today, of course, Peggy Liebel. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your beautiful voice. And we have Danielle Tucker. It's always great to play with you, to have you here on Sunday mornings, knowing that you come all the way from Ramona and you do it with such love, with such joy. Thank you for being here. And we have our guest speaker who um, actually donated Science of Mind magazines to each and every one of us this morning. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Reverend David S. Goldberg for being here. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And lastly, but of course, importantly, thank you for being here. Each one of you makes Sunday morning. So thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Thank you for being here and filling in these seats. You make these, these Sundays happen. So give yourself a round of applause. So please join me in our benediction. What I know is that there is only one power, one ubiquitous presence, one energy in, around, and through all that is and all that ever will be. And it is that one power, that one presence that is all of me and I am a part of it. And as I know that for myself, so too I know that for each beloved in this space, for anyone who can hear the sound of my voice, indeed for all sentient beings on the planet. And what I know as we leave this place, as we go into this week and in, in time ahead, that I call in the highest and best in every aspect of every individual's life. Mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, professional. It is all good because it is all God. And what I know is we are grounded in principle. We are absolutely open at the top. Mm, and how good it is. And I know that we live the concept of namaste, that the divinity in me blesses and recognizes the divinity in you. So I release, I simply release this word into that amazing alchemy of love and logic known as the law, knowing that it is done, knowing that it is granted, knowing that all is complete and whole, excellent and outstanding. So I just relax. I relax in that knowing that God always has my back and that the universe is always conspiring for my good, regardless of what it might look like to my human self. So I say thank you. I say thank you, Spirit. Thank you to that one power, that one presence. Thank you, God. All is well, and so it is. There was a time in my life I thought I had to do it all for myself I didn't know the grace of God was sufficient I didn't know the love of God was at hand Woo! But now I can say If you are discouraged Struggling just to make it through another day You've got to let it go And this is what you've got to say I release and I let go I let the Spirit run my life And my heart is open wide Yes, I'm only here for God No more struggle, no more strife With my No more struggle, no more strife 
affirmation for this week is love enriches my life in all ways. We'll say that together. Ready? Love enriches my life in all ways. Again, love enriches my life in all ways. One more time, like you really mean it. Wait, wait, wait. Love enriches my life in all ways. That was beautiful. Even without my prompt, it was perfect. And now our congregational song. I'm living in love, I'm living in peace, I'm living my life for what I believe, through joys and through fears, in this world I walk, God's grace moves through me, and it shines on us all, we are living in grace. As one family, we honor all truth As together we walk, God's grace moves through me And it moves through us all We are living in grace We are living in grace We are living in grace We are living Have a great week, everyone.